Um, I'm going to take it back to Skyler's first slide, or one of his early slides. So his picture comes up a lot at MIT, um, servo mechanisms lab, hooking up the early whirlwind to a machine to be able to achieve precision with a computer that is acting on um, material. So programmable, the panel, if we are enacting efforts on material by programming machines, then maybe this is the earliest instantiation of it, 1951. Uh, maybe uh, Nicholas was still known as Nicky. Uh, or maybe he's about my age, I think. The uh, uh, thing, though, about this machine is that this is still how we create stuff. Um, I'm in the Center for Bits and Atoms, and we work together with NASA Ames sometime, and this is their milling machine. They use it to make large titanium parts that end up on the space station. This is the same milling machine as is in that picture from Popular Mechanics in 1950. Um, that one ran on a vacuum tube machine. This one runs Windows XP. <laughs> it's uh, not necessarily a whole lot of change has taken place in terms of how we're programming um, the machines that we're using to create different kinds of material structures. And when I first showed up at MIT, I thought that the way that we were going to make this uh, more broadly applicable was everything was going to be um, smaller, cheaper, and easy to take home and use at a personal scale, personal fabrication um, as you had industrial fabrication. So this is a, a milling machine that is made on a milling machine um, that is $400 in parts, and you can program it to do largely the same kind of operations as the Cincinnati Hydrotel. However, if you think about the ENIAC, for example, as a large mainframe computer that is able to do any kind of calculation, and you think about your phone, um, you do the same calculations and you end up with the same answer. Your phone might just take a lot longer, or probably by now a lot faster than the ENIAC computer. However, if you take the Cincinnati Hydrotel and you take this machine, they're not actually able to make the same things. Um, this smaller machine can only make smaller things. It is less stiff and therefore can make things that are less precise. Uh, and so this kind of reimagining of what programming material is like or what it is like to fabricate stuff, um, making everything just smaller and cheaper is not really um, the direction that maybe we should be going in. If you look at why this is the case, you know, as people develop digital fabrication as we know it now, um, CAD tools, CAM tools, uh, and the machinists that um, would execute those programs, those are all different roles. Those are all people. You know, we're programming, um, programming things, but things do not just program themselves. Um, in your introduction, Skylar, you said that I make machines that make machines. This is not true. I just make machines that make stuff. <laughs> the, uh, and the people that program those machines are who decides what stuff gets made. And when you program a machine now, you enact all of the different roles of these people or these jobs and careers that have taken um, place and are really historically grounded. At the time, you needed someone else who was going to be running a computer because, like Nicholas mentioned, those things were $250,000. Um, and someone else was running the milling machine because it was also similarly expensive. And now all of those things are easier, more accessible, and kind of collapsing, and yet the fields that uh, that they embody remain sort of separate. I can program geometry in Rhino. I can program um, sensor networks with a lab view. And yet, if you wanted to easily flow from one data flow graph to the next, there aren't necessarily a whole lot of easy connection points between the two. Uh, so in reimagining what maybe digital fabrication could look like, uh, together with Alain Moyer, uh, I thought maybe instead of mainframes, what we need is laptops. You know, let's ma ma make things portable. This is a, uh, a, uh, a pop-up digital fabrication machine that you could bring around. And it's a 3D printer and a milling machine and a cutting machine. Um, and uh, for some reason, when I take it on airplanes, the TSA never asks me questions about it. It's strange. <laughs> and, <laughs> They ask me questions about my mouse a lot, you know, my, uh, my 3D mouse, but not about um, this machine. And it, uh, it's downstairs. Downstairs? Yes, downstairs. So if you wanted to come see it, uh, I can show you how we made it and, and what it does. But it doesn't actually make things that are much more exciting than this small plastic fish. Um, I can make circuit boards. The circuit boards can run uh, the stepper motors of the machine, but it doesn't really extend outside of the work envelope of this suitcase. 
And so even though it's portable, it doesn't necessarily work on its environment. You can just take it with you and it becomes something that you can do um, what you otherwise would do in a large lab um, with. And that was a, a, a kind of frustrating exercise as well to actually make this all fit into one briefcase. To be able to control um, both a 3D print head and a milling head, you need different electronics. Different electronics then have to be added to this different board. Um, at some point, I wanted it to also pipette, so do liquid handling for bio experiments, and then to augment that board, um, to be able to do other kinds of control system things. It was very frustrating. You have to redesign the whole thing and then change things. And so we um, decided it would be easier if machines were controlled through networks of control nodes rather than a single um, control unit. And historically, this has not been the case because the bandwidth of communication between nodes on a network wasn't um, high enough to be able to do things like moving around really fast. Uh, but now that is no longer the case. And so doing network controls for machines is really um, quite feasible. And to not stop there, um, we also thought, well, well, why do we necessarily also have to have this single work envelope? If I want to make something that's really thin and long, versus something that's really small or something that's really big, why can't I just change the machine on the fly to accommodate that? Um, and so these are reconfigurable modular machine parts that you then assemble into machines, as opposed to saying, here's the Star Trek replicator. It can do everything for everyone. We're not gonna tell you how it was made because we don't know either. Um, hello. And so, each one of these uh, uh, nodes, um, mechanical nodes, corresponds to an electrical node, which then in software also corresponds um, to uh, a virtual machine, or what we have confusingly called a virtual machine. And then there's some software application that needs to um, program it all, or the interface. And here is a... a version of uh, the machine that we assembled to do foam cutting. So this is four axis control. Very useful to have four axis control if you wanted to make an object that says hell on one side or yeah on the other or a circle on one side and a square on the other. Um, and uh, so here you can see the network nodes. And uh, the way that we're actually running this machine though is it's still totally separate where we have a design file which then creates a toolpath, which is then being run on the machine. So it's still um, enacting the same hierarchy of, uh, of, of, of things that happen one after another. Um, and uh, this is how it was programmed. It creates like a file. It's not necessarily exactly the same code that's running the Cincinnati Hydrotel. It's not G code, but it's still very, very similar. Um, and that's maybe not the way in which workflow composition uh, should take place. If I wanted to say, for example, here is a Petri dish. When it turns pink, please heat it up to this temperature and then shake it around a bunch. How am I going to specify that um, in that kind of programming language? They haven't really kept up. And so this is a, a, a browser-based environment for doing workflow composition for digital fabrication and also other kinds of processes. Oops. Uh, where uh, um, instead of saying, okay, I'm going to make one file that is then going to go from my computer to the computer that is inevitably attached to these digital fabrication machines and run it, you can say, okay, we can actually, now we even have the bandwidth that we can do closed loop control from within what you would otherwise consider the master um, computer or the um, computer that is trying to generate um, the uh, uh, instructions for the machines. And so instead of uh, the kind of classical, you have some kind of file, you know, you can add a uh, video input and have your machine respond to um, the environment that way or add different kinds of components. And, and the reason that we're doing this all in the browser is because the idea is that this is going to be something that is not done by people like me, but it's done by people like kids or people who are uh, trying to automate something in a different kind of space. Um, and so here you can quickly create tool paths of your face, very useful. Um, and I guess uh, doing all of this, we made uh, different machines uh, for different applications. This was an a airfoil that we made for um, colleagues in the lab. You know, how do you, where do you find a six foot wide foam cutter the last moment? Well, you could also just make one. Or uh, this is uh, work that we're doing with Jeff Kuhn's studio where he constantly needs to measure all kinds of crazy things and build all kinds of crazy things. And so if you need to take 
um, 8,000 photographs of a single object, it's a rather tedious task to do by hand. So can you have um, people who are working in a studio automate those things with uh, machines like this as well? But it's not so useful necessarily for only me to have access to these tools. And, and uh, you know, the concept of modularity in machines and modularity in construction of machines, so not rapid prototyping, but rapid prototyping of rapid prototyping or rapidly automating things. Like how do you lower the threshold from where you would otherwise say this is something you need to do by hand to this is something that you can automate. Um, and so we made a version of this machine kit out of uh, cardboard. And the idea there is that anyone should be able to make a machine not as a semester project, not as an undergraduate like in Mechie at MIT, but as um, someone who is not necessarily familiar with all engineering, but um, is okay with spending an afternoon um, putting together things out of cardboard and assembling a machine and doing then another iteration once they figured out the first automation workflow. Uh, so there are, uh, the Center for Bits and Atoms has sort of a, outreach network slash um, has facilitated for a long time the Fab Lab network. And Fab Labs uh, take this class called Fab Academy, which is a parable of how to make almost anything at MIT. And so they were kind of the first um, testers of this kit where can they make different kinds of machines using these modular um, components. And, uh, and so this is what they did. You can see that you know cardboard is not a material where someone is like, oh, I don't know how to drill a hole in that, or I don't know how to modify that. You just kind of cut it, you add some glue, it's no big deal. Um, so they made some whimsical machines, like these coffee stirring machines or a light show machine. But you can see also um, what originally was considered difficult, five axis control, is not necessarily considered difficult anymore when everything is sort of morphable as uh, you just add more axes. You know, you want six axis control, you want seven axis control, you know, who cares? Just add more things to the network. Um, so you have traditional like machines like a lathe, also non-traditional machines like precision ketchup application. Um, and this kind of, uh, it seems all kind of whimsical, right? These are all sort of silly machines maybe, but uh, if you can have whimsy with the precision of computer control, or if you can have whimsy with automation, then imagine the things that you could do for other things that require precision, precision agriculture, or, uh, medical applications. And, uh, and so this uh, tool chain or tool kit idea of how to build things up as uh, uh, automatable, I think is, uh, is really um, powerful. And, and being, being able to really interplay between different systems is, uh, is an important component of, uh, of designing machines like this. And so in terms of being um, material, maybe I'm still sort of behind the self-assembly lab. Uh, I'm not programming materials, I'm just making it easy to program other things for the production of things. <laughs> <laughs>